Hi, today we're going to talk about how to manage operations and supply chains. So let's start by briefly talking about what operations management is. It's essentially the transformation of resources, of all inputs, energy, and time and people into uh, the goods and services that the company is going to offer in the marketplace. So broadly speaking, is how we take all our inputs and we uh, create the processes that we require to create the outputs uh, that the firm is going to offer in the marketplace. Now, the name operations management has shifted from the traditional name that these kind of functions were given before, which used to be, uh, they used to be known as production. Uh, but the term production implies that there is a product that is coming at the end of the line. And as we know, uh, most modern economies, most, most developed economies like the US and most European countries and Japan, and so on and so forth. And they have over 80% of their GDP comes from services. So because of that, talking about manufacturing or talking about production now, eh, it doesn't really include services into the story. So what we have done is we have changed the term, we call it operations, and now that includes both products and services. Okay, so, like I was mentioning before, we have manufacturing, right, which are all the set of processes that are used by the firm to obtain uh, tangible goods from the inputs that are necessary for their creation. Okay. And a very similar term that it's used a lot is production, which is also the set of processes that it's used to make uh, tangible products or goods. And, and finally, we have operations, which is uh, the set of processes that the firm uh, uses to transform the inputs into both tangible or intangible products. So just offerings in general. So the idea behind uh, operations in all the cases is to take the set of inputs that the company requires and to what, using whatever processes are needed, transform them into the offering that the firm is going to have in the marketplace, whether it's a product, a service, or maybe a solution, which will be a combination of both products and services, right? So what kind of inputs are we talking about? Well, the usual inputs that we have discussed in other parts of this course will apply, right? So you're gonna have essentially capital, which is going to be dollars in our case, right? Uh, you're gonna have labor, which is gonna be uh, talent that you're gonna hire and pay for for their time. And then you're gonna have some sort of uh, list of raw materials that you're going to need, and that will uh, include anything that that particular product is going to need for its creation. So you're gonna have some suppliers there. And then finally, you're gonna have energy, right? Most of the time in the form of electricity, but you know any form of energy that you require, right? And so what kind of outputs are you going to get out of this process that transforms those inputs? It's going to be the goods or services, right? And like I mentioned, this is the term operations uh, used more broadly than just talking about production processes. So also how you deliver services. And, and usually this set of processes are complex uh, and the engineering behind the processes uh, is what oftentimes makes a company more efficient and effective at delivering the products into the marketplace. So here you have a figure trying to capture these ideas that we have been talking about. So we start with the inputs, which is going to be capital, labor, energy, and people. And then we're gonna have a set of processes, which are the ones that we are talking about that are gonna transform those inputs into the both goods and services uh, that we are going to be offering in the marketplace, right? And the idea behind this is trying to understand how these processes work, at least to some degree, design them and create some sort of feedback loop that enables us to see whether we are actually doing a good job at transforming these raw materials into the products that we offer in the marketplace, uh, both including quality control, uh, efficiency, inside of the firm, but also having some input 
from the consumer side as well, right? Uh, quality, for example, you can define it as we will see later from an engineering perspective, but at the end of the day, quality is gonna be determined by the customer, right? The perception of the quality of the customer. So you're gonna need some customer feedback in the loop as well. So when we're talking about operations management, one of the big, distinct, big distinctions that we're going to make is we're gonna be talking also about services, not only products. Now, services um, are different uh, in several aspects, but probably the most important aspect of services is that they require uh, a lot of involvement from the uh, delivery perspective from the front. So there's going to be, uh, they tend to be highly intensive in uh, employee participation. So you're gonna have a lot of contact with the customer. Typical example of that would be getting a haircut, right? So at the end of the day, the haircuts cannot be stored on the shelves. Uh, they need to be delivered or performed at the time that the service is acquired by the customer, right? So in most services, you're gonna have this customer contact uh, that it's gonna make uh, the service delivery and standardization a lot more challenging, right? And so ideally what you would like to do is try to reduce uh, a lot of the variability that is gonna arise from the fact that uh, there is direct customer contact by using technology if possible, right? So if you can standardize some of those processes using technology, uh, you're gonna be usually better off. However, for the most part, you're gonna, not gonna be 100% able to do this. So there's still going to be this human interaction that makes services particularly challenging from a managerial perspective. Let's talk about the characteristics that make services unique so that we can see what some of these challenges are going to be. So what makes services unique? Well, there are a set of uh, characteristics of services that make them uh, more difficult to manage, okay? So let me go through some of them in a little bit of detail. So let's start with intangibility. Tangibility means that you cannot use your touch essentially uh, before buying the product, right? In this case, before buying the service. So when you go to a store and you are looking at a product, I don't know, for example, uh, a cell phone, a smartphone, let's say, right? You can actually get to feel the product, you get to try the product uh, at the store. So that gives you an idea, at least, you know, some sense of how the product's going to operate. But with services, oftentimes that uh, opportunity is not there, right? So before you take your car to get service at a particular shop, you don't know how the service is going to be. Right, so there is no opportunity for you to uh, sense the product you think using your senses and just get an idea of how that product's gonna work out. Same thing happens with a haircut, right? So until you actually get the haircut, uh, this the company can actually show you pictures of other people with the kind of haircut that they are trying uh, to provide to you, but. As we all know, uh, there seems to be a discrepancy between the way it looks in the picture and the way it actually uh, ends up looking on you, right? And then you have inseparability, which is this idea that the delivery of the service and the production happen simultaneously, right? So there is no storing the services on a shelf. There is no inventory management when it comes down to that, right? Because the service, uh, basically gets performed and produced at the same time as it's sold, right? So this creates all sorts of challenges from a company perspective, right? What this does is it, for example, creates a capacity problem. So if you have a restaurant, right? Oftentimes what will happen is there are some peak times where people are going to come to the restaurant more. Like for example, during uh, evening hours when people are going to eat dinner. Right, so let's say in the United States, that will be maybe between 6 and 8 p.m., right? So when you're deciding on the capacity of the restaurant, because this is inseparability, you cannot have uh, extra capacity uh, allowed 
for these peak times, right? So managing of demand, especially if there is seasonality, if demand fluctuates widely, whether it is during the day or maybe during different seasons, is going to be uh, critical to manage because you cannot have stored inventory of the product. The product, in this case, the service, needs to be delivered uh, at the same time that it's consumed. So this is going to create certain challenges. Another aspect of this is variability, right? So the fact that there is a lot of human contact in the delivery of the service is going to make that the way the service is delivered uh, from one time to another is going to change, right? because we we're all humans we know that you know delivering exactly the same performance time and time again it is difficult right circumstances change and because of that uh, the service that is provided to the customer is going to change quite a bit from one time to another okay and then we have perishability which is this idea that uh, if the product and sorry if the service doesn't get purchased at the time there is no way to inventory it you can see this clearly in, in the case of an airline, right? So if the airline has a capacity in that particular flight for 200 passengers, right? If 10 people do not show up to the airport and nobody takes their place, those 10 seats, right, uh, fly empty and there is no way to get those 10 seats back, right? So the service becomes perishable. There is no way to put the extra uh, service in inventory so that you can sell it at a later time okay then and this is similar to the variability aspect there is the use of participation so uh, within the service uh, there is direct contact between the firm and the user and oftentimes the performance that is delivered from the firm perspective it's going to be dependent on how uh, the user cooperates right so for example if you're getting a haircut uh, you're going to get some instructions from the uh, from the person that it's actually providing the haircut for you and if you do not follow those instructions closely that is going to create a challenge on obtaining good quality service right and you know if you put all this together you have the same problem with lack of ownership which is that uh, because of all the characteristics that i've described before until you actually uh, uh, purchase the product uh, nobody owns it because the actual service doesn't exist yet okay so all these characteristics are going to make services a lot more challenging to manage than products are so let's talk a little bit about what happens with products right so let's start with uh, how the how the products come up to be so you need to usually start with the customer right so what you're going to do is you're going to try to understand what customers uh, want, what customers are lacking right now in the marketplace, what are the pain points, right? And we're going to use market research for that. So we're going to have different means of getting information from customers about what exactly it is that they want and they are willing to pay for, therefore. And based on that, we're going to try to design uh, new products, right? And that design process, it's depending on the firm and the industry, rather lengthy and expensive, right? So you have extreme cases, companies like Boeing, right? That uh, design planes and their design cycle from the moment that they start with an idea until they can actually sell planes is upwards of five years, right? So that uh, time and investment of people and, and capital uh, it needs to be financed, right? So this is an expensive process. And because of this, what happens is some firms will actually develop the products jointly, right? So you have examples, for example, uh, the car manufacturing business, uh, you have Toyota and BMW getting together uh, to design uh, the new Toyota Supra because Toyota didn't have a platform, an engine that was suitable for what they wanted to do, but BMW did. So they actually got together and co-designed the product so that Toyota can actually sell it in the marketplace and to a degree uh, compete with BMW themselves uh, uh, in the same market space, right? Sports cars. So there are plenty of examples of companies that actually uh, get together, even though they are competing in similar spaces, but they co-develop the product jointly. Okay. Um, and essentially what you're doing is you're trying to create a feasible design right? and 
to do that, what you do is you do R&D, research and development, which is an investment uh, that is going to require both time and money. Now, when it comes down to designing products, uh, what we're going to see is that there is a spectrum of uh, strategies that we can actually use, you know, from the ones that are trying to design the same product for everybody, that would be standardization, to creating customized products, one to each individual. And of course, there's going to be an important trade-off that is going to happen there, right? So standardization, what we're going to do is we're going to achieve a much lower cost of production, and hence we're going to be able to sell those products at a cheaper price uh, to the customers, right? And the classic example of this will be at the Ford Model T, right? The idea of having a product that is as simplified from the options perspective that uh, Henry Ford is well known for, for saying that, yeah, you can have any color so long as it's black. So there was only one color choice for the car. And the idea of standardizing something like, you know, paint, but, you know, the automobile in general, it's that as you have less options, there is less complexity in the both design aspect and also in the manufacturing aspect of the product or the livery of the service. And because of that, you can pass in some of these uh, lower cost into the consumer. Okay, so that's the idea of standardization. And then something in between standardization and custom products is this idea of modular design, where what you do is you break down the design of the product or service into its core aspects and you standardize the core aspects that are usually the expensive ones to actually uh, both design and manufacture. So uh, you just standardize the core and then what you do is you add other aspects around the, the product or the service uh, that we call modules, right? And those enable you to, to some degree, customize the product, even though the core of the product, it's, it's standardized. And hence, you can leverage some of those uh, cost savings of the standardization, but maintaining a little bit of customization through these modules. Let me show you some examples. So here you have, for example, the Volkswagen Group, uh, the largest car manufacturer in the world at this time, at the time of this presentation. And here you have some of the cars uh, in the Volkswagen Group. There are multiple brands in here. You have Audi, you have Skoda, uh, you have Volkswagen itself, you have Seat, right? So there are multiple brands within uh, this large uh, car manufacturing conglomerate, Volkswagen. And they have a, a platform, which is essentially the underpinnings of the car. Let's say the, you know, the structure underneath, you have uh, all uh, including within this, the suspension design and the, the chassis of the car and some of the components that deal with both engines and transmissions and that are common across all these different cars that you can see in the picture. Right. And the interesting thing is then what you do is you modify this platform in ways that from a consumer perspective, this uh, you get very, very different products. Right. So you have from a compact car uh, like a Golf here to a full size vehicle uh, like this Skoda over here to SUVs or uh, the case here of the Seat Altea, which is a minivan, right? They all share the same platform. So you can basically obtain economies of scale by producing the same core of the product. But then from a consumer perspective, these are very different vehicles that satisfy different needs. So there is a little bit of customization that can actually happen, even though the core of the product is standardized. This is the idea of modular design. Okay. And then finally, what we have at the other end of the spectrum of product design is customization, where you actually uh, acknowledge the fact that all customers are unique. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to cater as much as possible to the, that uniqueness of uh, desires from a consumer perspective. And the kind of processes that are involved in this is, are essentially something called mass customization, where it enables you to maybe uh, produce a product that is unique for each customer. Uh, 
couple of interesting examples of this at least let's talk about one uh, you can go to m&m's uh, website and you can just create a bag of m&m's with for example the name of uh, your significant other right so that way you take a product that is very typical right an m&m &M, and you customize it for a special occasion maybe for valentine's day right so what this is enabling you to do is because of some of the modern technology that is enables you to reasonably eff efficiently and effectively uh, produce uh, smaller batches uh, of of products that are unique right so we have some uh, interesting technologies in printing that enable this for example uh, and basically you can deliver a unique product uh, for a customer uh, that is going to satisfy their needs. One of the important aspects of operations is capacity, right? So after you've designed your product, the question is how much of that product or service are you going to be able to provide in a given time frame, right? And this is the idea of capacity. What is the maximum load that that organizational unit is going to be able to handle, right? Um, this unit can be measured, the capacity, either in inputs or outputs, although most of the times what you will see it is in terms of outputs. So how many cars can the production facility uh, uh, produce in a certain unit of time, like for example, per day, right? Uh, now, the thing with capacity you will think is the more is the better, but there is a trade-off, right? Building capacity that is not gonna be used is costly. So having machines, that are gonna enable you to produce larger quantities of the product uh, requires more expensive in, uh, production systems, right? So you don't wanna have a capacity that is too high because it basically, uh, it makes running at lower capacity inefficient and it more costly. And also you don't wanna have a capacity that is too low because then what's gonna happen is you're not gonna be able to fulfill the demand in the marketplace. So actually uh, figuring out what is the necessary capacity for a firm is actually important. Now, how do we know what capacity we actually need? Well, for that, we're gonna have to do some demand estimation, right? To have an idea of uh, how many of our products are there going to be sold in the marketplace. And this is gonna require some forecasting, right? So what I'm going to do here is discuss uh, two aspects of that uh, demand estimation that are important. So we're trying to get to demand estimation, but before we get there, I'm gonna discuss this idea of market potential which is essentially the largest figure that you could potentially sell if the entire market will be served by you. Now, obviously this is an idealistic scenario that it's not going to happen for the most part in uh, reality, unless you, ha you are a legal monopoly and then uh, market potential, it's essentially the same as demand estimation. But for Typical firms, this is an intermediate step that you need to take before you can actually get an idea of what the demand is going to be for your product so that you can guess uh, what the capacity is that you are going to need. So let's try to estimate what uh, the, our market potential is going to be, okay? And there are different ways of doing this and I'm gonna describe one that is simple that uh, you guys can use for your project and you should use for your project for your uh, business plan, for your small company. Uh, and this is called a top-down approach. So you start with a large figure and you essentially uh, remove uh, the parts that are not reasonable with that, within that large population value and you end up with your market potential estimate. The other way of doing this is instead of from the top down is to start from the bottom and then aggregate up. And, but that requires usually more data than what you're gonna have access to. It requires usually primary data collection, which you may or may not be able to do. So I'm gonna describe one method here. There are others. Uh, let's just stick to the simple to start with, okay? So what do you do in the market potential estimation? You just start with a large number that uh, captures all the potential buyers in a marketplace. So for example, in the United States, you could start with the number of people that live in the United States. So roughly, let's say about 350 million people, right? 
or if the unit of analysis that you're interested in is, is the household, not actually individuals, then you will start with the number of households, which is about 100 million. Right? So you start with that big number, and then what you do is you come up with some sort of uh, removing from that large number all the parts that do not belong, right? So for example, if you start with the population of the United States, but you're talking about trying to come up with a market potential for an alcoholic beverage, like let's say a new beer, right? In that situation, all 330 million people are probably uh, not uh, the right number that you want to start with, right? So you will, why? Because legally you are not allowed to drink beer unless you are 21 years of age. So anywhere, anyone that lives in the United States between the age of zero, basically when they are born, and 21 uh, should not be included into that market potential estimate. So you will take those 300 and and uh, 30 million people, you will go to the Census Bureau website and you will find out the percentage of Americans that are between the ages of 0 and 21, and you will remove that portion from the 330 million people. So let's say that that's 70 million people. Now you have uh, 260 million that uh, are potential uh, buyers for you. Right? After you have uh, thinned down your large number uh, into something that it's more manageable uh, and basically more accurate because of the characteristics of your product or service, then what you're going to need is you're going to need some sort of uh, usage rate, the number of beers, if you're interested in beer, that the average American buys in, let's say, a month, right? So if the number of beers that an average American buys a month is three, for example, that will be your usage rate. By the way, obviously, this can be adjusted by whatever uh, unit of time you're interested in, right? So if you know that the average uh, usage rate for beer in a month is three beers, uh, that will be equivalent if you want to get an estimate per year of uh, 36 um, beers uh, per year, right? So you can adjust this to whatever time unit uh, you're interested in estimating your market potential for. Okay? And then after we have the usage rate, which is the number of products that those people uh, are going to buy on average, uh, is how much are they paying for those products? And again, this is an average figure. If it's a new product and still not out in the marketplace, what you're going to do is you're going to try to determine what is their willingness to pay, right? Because the product's still not in the market. So then what you need to do is you need to gauge this by maybe doing some uh, market research, right? So it will require probably doing some sort of survey or maybe a more complex technique like conjoint analysis that will enable you to ascertain how much people are willing to pay for a new product. So for your uh, plan, for your business plan, uh, you should collect some data on how much people are willing to pay for your proposed product. Okay. And you can do this with, you know, family and friends. You can do it in Facebook. You can do it using whatever simple means you want. But if you actually collect some data, you can back up your estimates based on some research, right? So willingness to pay. Right? Or if it's a product that it's already in the marketplace, it will be average price that people are paying at this point. Now, what you have once that you have these three elements, you have the number of potential buyers by starting with a large figure and then slicing it down into uh, the proportion of those potential buyers that are likely to buy the product. Then later you have your usage rate, which is the number of uh, units of the product or service that people are going to buy in a certain unit of time. And then you have your willingness to pay or average price that people are paying for that product. The product of these three terms is going to give you the market potential for that product. Okay, so this is how we are going to get a guess on what the market potential is for our product. You should do this for your product idea uh, or your service idea uh, for your product plan. And you're going to have to get these figures, right? You're going to have to start with a large number. You're going to have to determine what segments are the most likely uh, buyers of your product. Try to identify 
who those are and how many people are in the market of influence that you're interested in. Maybe you're only starting now in the Richmond area. So how many people live in the Richmond area? And out of those people, how many people are likely to buy my product based on the characteristics of the product? And of course, this is going to vary by product or service, right? And then based on that, how like how many units of that product or service are they going to uh, be buying? You can do some market research on this. You can do a survey. And then uh, what? how much are they willing to pay for the product or what is the average price if that product is already in the marketplace that people are buying, uh, sorry, are paying for it. And the product of these two terms will give you your estimated market potential. Now, why are you doing this? You're doing this because you're trying to know what your demand is going to be. You're trying to guess or estimate or forecast why, what is the number of units of your product that you're gonna be selling, let's say, at a unit of time like a month, for example, okay? And to do this, you start with your market potential, which we have just determined how to compute. And now what you need to do is you need to multiply that by the percentage of the market that you think you can capture. And we call this market share, right? Market share is what percentage of the entire marketplace sales uh, you could basically uh, deliver in a certain unit of time, right? And again, market share determination, you're gonna to have to make some guesses. You can use questions to determine this. You can give people choices of products that are already existing in the marketplace and the product that you're proposing. And based on the responses that they give you on the, that choice uh, scenario, you can have an idea of what percentage market share you could be uh, obtaining, okay? And so after you have all this information, you can now start making some more educated guesses on the capacity that you're going to need for your uh, firm, right? Because otherwise, how do you know how many employees do you need? How many locations do you need to contract out some of the services that you're providing, et cetera, et cetera. So estimating demand is absolutely essential for you to determine what the capacity yeah is that you need to build within your operations management system. Other than capacity, the next thing you're gonna to have to determine is where are you gonna be operating, right? And basically where your operations are gonna be running. So the location, it's a very important uh, decision that you're gonna to have to make other than capacity. And what aspects should you take into consideration? Things like how far are you going to be from your primary market, right? So proximity to market is important, especially if the products or services that you're providing require direct con contact with the customer, like we were talking about most services do. And in that situation, the location is gonna be absolutely essential. And if you are not, uh, if you don't require a lot of customer contact, uh, how expensive it is to ship the products from your production facility to the location where the demand actually is, right? So proximity to market uh, plays a key role both with products and services because sometimes the shipping of the product is expensive. If it's a heavy product, that will be the case. For example, if it's light and small, maybe, you know, location becomes less relevant for production uh, determination because you can just go and go and ship the products anyway, right? But if you're talking about something heavy, expensive to ship, maybe because it's dangerous, right? Um, or if you have a lot of direct contact with the customer, like in the case of most services, then location is absolutely essential, right? What else are important factors to consider? Availability of uh, raw materials and transportation linkages. So here in the United States, a lot of the firms that do uh, any uh, heavy manufacturing, they are located close to uh, rail, right? Because a lot of the raw uh, products get delivered uh, using trains. And so where you set up your production facilities is gonna be a function of many of these aspects, right? Uh, another thing that will be important oftentimes when it's a large plant that you're setting up or a large service center 
is whether uh, the local government is going to give you some incentives to actually set up the production facilities or the service delivering uh, center within that space. And oftentimes you will get a tax, a tax reduction or tax removals altogether uh, or any other set of incentives if you're setting up operations and creating jobs within a certain locality. So we've talked about location, we've talked about capacity. Another thing that you need to plan for is the kind of technology that you're gonna use for uh, the design, production, and delivery of the products to the marketplace. And there are a lot of exciting technologies that companies use right now uh, for these processes. One is computer-assisted design, right? The idea that instead of designing the product using paper and pencil, the old-fashioned way. Now what we do is we use computers and to do that, and that enables you to actually uh, do the designs faster, so you can just go faster from uh, the design aspects to the production aspects. The software will help you not only with creating the, the product design, but also uh, checking for the manufacturability of the product. So whether what you are designing is something that can be easily uh, moved into a manufacturing uh, setting. So it's going to help you in that process. Um, so there is a linkage or integration between the design aspects and manufacturing aspects. And we also see this uh, trend moving towards flexible manufacturing, especially for companies that are interested in either A, reducing the cost of production uh, so you're going to see the use of things like robots i'm going to paste and uh, i'm going to put in the description of these videos uh, of this video a couple of links to one uh, a video where you can see uh, the some of the robots that amazon uses for its fulfillment services uh, which i think is kind of interesting so you can see how you can use this automation to uh, decrease the cost of running some services, in this case, the delivery of products. So this is a fulfillment aspect of, of the company, right? And you can also use drones. Actually, they are working quite hard right now in trying, Amazon has, in trying to reduce the time that it takes from the moment that you place an order to the moment that you actually get the product uh, in your hands. Right? And one of the aspects that they are testing, uh, although it's still not operational, is this idea of using drones for this. Right, So when I'm talking about flexible manufacturing, it's not only applying to products, but also applies to services as well. Right, and So technology is having a huge impact in, in how we design the processes of production, basically. Okay. Another aspect that it's now this essential other than the technology that you're using, the capacity that you need to build and the location where it happens is this idea of sustainability. So uh, it's essentially using the resources of the planet wisely. So it's not just about designing the product that the customer wants with the technology that we have, but also maybe creating new technologies, new products, and new processes that enable us to do that in a way that is more sustainable for the environment. This is a huge trend right now. You can see it in pretty much any product or services that you're going to encounter. Everybody's going to tell you how they are recycling, how they are lowering their impact uh, on the environment. And I think at the end of the day, anything that is going to be better for the planet is going to be better for us. And if you're doing any of these aspects uh, within the firm, which you probably are, and you need to let customers know that you're doing it so they can actually appreciate the efforts that you're putting for improving the sustainability of your products and services. So, so far we've discussed operations aspects, but operations is just one piece within the supply chain. And so the supply chain is all the systems and processes that connect the raw materials and the consumer. So it's everything from sourcing the materials and talent, energy, everything that you need to either make the product or provide the service. So that aspect will be the operation side. 
and then later take that product or service to the final consumer. And that's going to involve things like intermediaries that are going to help you take that product and, and put it into the hands of the people that are going to be buying it when they want it and, and where they want it. Right? So it's going to include other aspects that we have not discussed before, like procurement, which it's basically uh, buying the raw materials and, and inputs that you need for your operations. Uh, it's going to involve also logistics, which is basically uh, the physical uh, the physical movement, the design of the physical movement systems that will enable you to get the inputs and also take the outputs uh, into the marketplace. So operations are just one part, maybe one of the more visible parts of the supply chain. Uh, that I'm talking about, but at the end of the day, supply chain is bigger than just operations. Operations is just one aspect within the supply chain. So let me talk a little bit more in detail about the different aspects of the supply chain. And let's talk with procurement, which is basically securing uh, the materials and inputs that are needed for the uh, operations aspect of the company. Right. So in many firms, uh, Procurement is actually called purchasing, and in large organizations, there will be a department that will be in charge of doing this. And what they are going to try to do is they are going to try to basically secure uh, suppliers that is going to enable it's going to enable them to have the right quantities and quality of uh, materials and inputs uh, at the time that they need it and in the quantities that are needed. And this is actually not a simple process right oftentimes firms uh, are going to have uh, large lead times before they uh, qualify somebody to be uh, a new supplier for them and the procurement department or the purchasing department is going to play a key role within this uh, so what are the variables that they're going to be looking at whether the firm can actually deliver on their promises Right, which is not a trivial thing when you're talking about uh, supplying large quantities of uh, a product or service that might actually not be standard. It might be custom made for the firm, right? And they are also obviously going to be looking at the cost, right? Also availability, how flexible are they? Can they actually uh, provide a larger quantity if it actually needed? Uh, and how reliable are they? If they tell you that they're going to do something, are they actually going to do it or not? And this is how a lot of the suppliers are going to be qualified within large firms. Once that we have determined uh, who our suppliers are going to be, uh, it's important for us to talk about inventory. Inventory is essentially all the raw materials and elements that are going to be used by the company for their operations. Okay. And we're going to distinguish three different types of inventory. We're going to talk about raw materials which is the inventory of the parts that are going to come in the, uh, as inputs into the firm. Right? So these are going to come directly from our suppliers. You're going to have also inventory of work in process. And those are the partly finished uh, elements of the production line. So for example, if you are building cars, uh, one part of, of the car will be the transmission. So if you are building the transmissions yourself, uh, you will have, you know, uh, at the different stages of the production line, that transmission is going to be uh, in different stages, right? So when you're doing an inventory assessment, uh, you're not only going to be tracking the raw parts, but also the working process parts, which are the ones that have already been partly assembled. Okay. And then you have finished goods inventory. So when the car is finished, uh, that will be part of the finished goods inventory. And you're also obviously keeping track of those cars that you have finished in the case of a car manufacturer. Now, once that we have defined the three different types of inventory, we need to come up with some sort of uh, decision process to know A, what the level of inventory is at the different stages of the production process uh, and also to come up with rules as to how that inventory is managed. So we have a whole host of rules and processes around inventory and we call those inventory control. Okay, 
and there are different systems that can be used for inventory control uh, for example you have just in time just in time inventory management uh, which was pioneered in japan in the 80s and it's the idea of try to minimize the uh, inventory uh, at each of the different stages within the production system uh, so having just the minimum amount of inventory that will enable you to run your production without having uh, too many stoppages but trying to keep that uh, inventory at a minimum trying to minimize the cost of having all that either raw materials or uh, work in, pro in progress uh, inventory parts that are essentially not yielding any returns for you so it's taking the perspective that minimizing the inventory uh, in hand uh, will actually be a useful thing to be done by the firm. There are other uh, ways of doing the inventory management. Uh, you can do uh, economic order quantity model, which is trying to order parts in large ba batches just so that you can get a better uh, price because you're buying large quantities. So you're trying to minimize the number of orders that you're placing with your suppliers. Of course, this has the downside of asking or requiring from you to keep large quantities of inventory because once that you place the order, you're gonna have lots of raw materials that need to be stored into your, uh, into your warehouses, right? So this is trying to minimize the cost at the purchasing uh, point, but not necessarily minimizing the cost of holding all that inventory, which is what Just-in-Time was trying to do. And the other way of ordering is just uh, whatever is necessary to maintain uh, the production line running. So to have certain flexibility uh, level within the organization. So these are three different philosophies of running uh, and ordering your uh, raw materials so that you can just uh, minimize different types of costs. One more aspect that we should discuss is this idea of outsourcing. So the idea of outsourcing is moving part of your operations, for example, manufacturing, but it's not limited to manufacturing, uh, to other uh, companies, okay? So for example, you could take your customer service aspects of the firm, not necessarily the manufacturing, and outsource it to a different company because you think that they can do maybe a better job or most of the time because they can provide the same service or similar service at a lower cost. And so what's happening is that because of the globalization that we have seen in the last geez, 30 years at least, so this you know becoming more interconnected with other economies around the world, and uh, not only uh, the US, but you know moving beyond that to uh, Europe. Uh, in the US, you have, uh, for example, NAFTA, which we have already talked about. Uh, making the economies of Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. a lot more interconnected with a lot more trade. That means that you can actually take part of your operations and uh, moving them to uh, other countries, like in this case, Mexico or Canada. So, for example, car manufacturers will make some other cars in some of these neighbor uh, countries, uh, like, for example, Mexico, where maybe the cost of labor is actually going to be lower. Right, um, so this could potentially uh, enable you to be more competitive because what you're doing is you are basically assigning your resources uh, more optimally by moving them around the globe in the locations where those resources are going to yield the most returns. But the downside is that it has or it carries some public, uh, some negative public opinion, right? Because uh, obviously uh, people. Uh, don't feel like necessarily is the right thing to do because what you're doing is you're moving jobs from your country to other countries. So, you know, are you getting cheaper products, but at what cost? So to continue with our discussion on inventory, the next thing we need to talk about is what happens with those raw materials. You're gonna have to do some routing and scheduling. So that's gonna be uh, creating a sequence of operations through which the product is going to be passing so the like different stages within the firm 
and that will be routing and then you have scheduling which is and the assignment of required tasks to departments or even to specific machines, workers, etc. So it's the idea of creating the schedule that is going to determine what's going to happen within the organization uh, in that operations aspect, right? And the way to do the scheduling, uh, it's oftentimes uh, done using uh, PERT, which is a program evaluation and review technique, right? So what it does is it breaks down the process of production into the different activities that need to be actually completed before the products completed, right? Before the project's actually done. And then what it does is it tries to arrange the different activities and measure the times that actually need to be completed for each of them. And with those times, it's gonna uh, determine what is the critical path within the sequence of activities. So let me give you an example so that you can see what I'm talking about. Let's go through the next slide. So here you have a very simplistic BERT diagram for making a Big Mac, right? So you can see that in this case, there are eight activities that need to happen, right? From the beginning, when you get your raw materials, which you have a list right here, and how long it takes to actually uh, conduct that task is at the bottom of all the tasks in parentheses. That will be in seconds, right? So you can see you start with laying out the raw materials and then what you do is you have two tasks that can actually happen simultaneously. You can put the uh, party to cook or grill and that's gonna take two minutes or 120 seconds and at the same time that you're doing that you can actually apply uh, the sauce into the bread right into the bun right and then you have the different activities that are going to take place after that now notice that the colors of the arrows are different okay the blue set of arrows is going to be what we call the critical path why? Because for you to accomplish this task, which is to create the Big Mac, uh, the total amount of time that it's going to be required to do that is the one that includes all the elements that are on the critical path. Okay? So you can see that because grilling the patties takes 120 seconds, by the time you are done setting the sauce and spreading the sauce and the patties are still grilling so this this is the path that it's going to take the longest uh, from beginning to end okay obviously this is a very simplistic per diagram where you know it doesn't uh, really shed a lot of light but when you have a complex process like putting together a car which the average car has 30,000 parts on it and determining uh, the critical path is a non-trivial question and it's particularly important when you're trying to set capacities and inventories that are needed at the different stages okay now once that we have set up all all the raw material sourcing we have determined the scheduling and we have determined how the production path uh, it's going to happen and once that you start having output and maybe through the process you need to ascertain that the quality of the product is sufficient now what is quality uh, quality is going to be essentially a function of what the customers think is a reasonable performance for the product okay so quality is going to be a function then of consumer perception Okay, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to try to come up with the systems that enable us to measure this quality so that we have an idea of whether we're actually hitting the mark or not. Okay, so you're going to have to create metrics to determine uh, product quality or service quality both. And uh, you're going to have to be constantly monitoring these measures. Okay. Uh, quality control, it's uh, aspects of the firm that try to uh, ascertain that this quality that we're measuring, uh, we're achieving the target that we have set up for. So it's a function of some standards that you're going to set. We're going to talk about some uh, general standards of quality 
later on. And total quality management is essentially a philosophy that tries to uh, ensure that that quality level is going to uh, originate from all the different areas of the organization. Okay. Uh, type of uh, uh, the type of elements that are going to be here, uh, if you're interested in Googling, is for example, Six Sigma, uh, which is the idea of when you have many different parts in a system, uh, unless each of them uh, gets basically a extremely high level of quality uh, because of all the different components everything is gonna actually uh, there is a good chance that one of the parts is going to fail because there are so many components into the system so because of that unless all the parts have absolutely exceptional quality the system overall is going to have actually poor quality uh, overall so Total quality management, there is a whole host of tools that come with it, uh, one of which is statistical process control. So you're going to have to get better or get good at uh, determining uh, when that quality issue is going to be sufficiently large that you need to stop the process. Okay, and to do this, we're going to need things like sampling. So let me talk a little bit about the different uh, standards that uh, you can see for quality control. So ISO 9000 um, is a set of standards that are defined uh, from an engineering perspective and from a process engineering perspective so that we can just make sure that uh, whatever is going to come out of the production facility uh, it's going to have adequate uh, quality levels at least from a technical perspective. And there is an equivalent to that from an environmental standards perspective. It's called the ISO uh, 14000. And another thing that comes along with that is risk management within the organization. And the, those set standards are the ISO 19600. So for quality management, uh, one of the critical aspects is going to be inspection, right? So how do you know when a product or a service has sufficient level of quality? Well, you're going to have to measure it, like I mentioned. And the inspection is going to be the way we are going to be able to measure or ascertain whether the product or the service is going to fulfill our quality standards that may be having set through an ISO 9000 9, set of rules, right? So the problem with inspection is that oftentimes the inspection process is destructive. What this means is for you to know whether something is working as intended, you're going to have to take it to the end of the life cycle of that product. A typical example would be a light bulb, right? So how do you know how long that light bulb is going to work or operate for? Well, you're going to have to take it through different cycles. So for example, turning on, turning off the light bulb, maybe using a little robot or some sort of uh, program right and when it goes through x number of cycles it will just give up so how do you know uh, whether the quality is appropriate or not you're going to have to inspect a number of light bulbs and compute some sort of average number of cycles that the light bulb can go through or average number of hours that it can be on and of course uh, these are destructive methods of inspection not all inspection methods are destructive but oftentimes they are, and because of that, you're going to need sampling. Right? So what is sampling? Sampling essentially enables you to learn about the population from a sample. So instead of testing every light bulb that you actually make, especially if they are destructive methods, that will be very inefficient, right? Because you will have nothing to sell, because you will destruct every product to make sure that it meets the quality standards. So what you do instead of that is you sample. You take a percentage of the total that is selected usually through random methods to make sure that it doesn't get biased in any way. So maybe the beginning um, units of a batch of production are better or lower quality and depends on the process that you are actually employing. And because of that, if you only take a sample in the beginning and not throughout the whole production batch, uh, it, will, it will yield uh, biased estimates of quality. So what do you want to do is you want to have some sort of selection process that it's random that enables you to test a smaller sample and it gives you information about the entire population, in this case about your production process or system. Okay.